Just little by little. Uh, this is Anna Ferro from uh, Cespi, uh, based in, uh, in Italy. Uh, Cespi uh, is a think tank, uh, is a research center uh, based in Rome. Uh, it exists since uh, 1984 and with a very long, uh, more than 20 years experience on uh, migration and development and uh, transnational studies. So we are very happy to, um, to discuss today the, the results uh, of this uh, study uh, that was uh, undertaken by uh, Karim El Mufti uh, in Lebanon. And uh, the objective of this uh, webinar today is to um, discuss the, the three key words uh, in, in the studies that are uh, migration, uh, remittances and return. So uh, we, we started uh, with the remittances as a lens to look at the uh, migration phenomenon uh, linking uh, migrants with the origin country where money is sent and uh, with the destination country where migrants earn their money, so their life and work conditions. Uh, in this specific case, we, we analyzed the, the, uh, the story and life of uh, Ethiopian domestic workers considering uh, their labor conditions in, uh, in Lebanon, in Beirut, within the framework of the Kafala system and uh, the, the way uh, domestic workers uh, um, access uh, or do not access to the different uh, financial uh, services and systems uh, uh, related to uh, sending money. And uh, uh, a question was about uh, um, how are remittances linked also to their uh, life uh, projects or return projects. Uh, overall, we, we could say that um, we found a, a situation with a, a social and human cost for um, Ethiopian domestic workers to earn money in Lebanon and send remittances. Uh, just for you to know that yesterday was the International Remittance Day, so uh, we are in line with, the, um, with this um, global discussions. Um, the, the research took place in uh, uh, 2019, so that was before the, the COVID-19 and before the economic and financial crisis that uh, uh, hit Lebanon. So during we, our research, uh, we didn't uh, obviously uh, took into consideration these two um, external uh, elements that uh, hit Lebanon and hit uh, um, life uh, conditions of Ethiopian domestic workers. So today we are uh, discussing our results in relationship to this change scenario that worsened the vulnerability of these uh, workers women, migrants uh, uh, from Ethiopia in Lebanon. Um, this, um, this webinar will, uh, will have a, a structure with the uh, first opening from the uh, NGO Chelim, that is the leading partner of this uh, project. Then uh, uh, Karim El Mufti will offer you the, uh, an overview of the results of the research. And then we'll have this uh, valuable set of panelists that will uh, discuss the, the results and help us to understand what is happening today in Lebanon for um, these domestic workers and also to see um, and address the challenges that the, uh, the migration cycle is facing today between Lebanon and Ethiopia. So uh, you will have the opportunity to put questions to the panelists and the, to Karim uh, in the section uh, Q&A. So you can write uh, yourself the questions there, addressing to the different uh, panelists. So at the end, we will pick up all the questions. Uh, all the documents presented today uh, are available already online on the CHESPIS website. And we will also uh, record uh, this um, webinar. So it will be also available to you uh, further on. Uh, we also um, invite you to follow uh, Chespis Works because in July 
there will be a, a second meeting, second webinar organized uh, uh, in Ethiopia, uh, where this uh, uh, research took place also in the origin country of domestic workers. So today the, there is the presentation of the destination country side, Lebanon, and in July we will have the origin country side. And uh, in autumn there will be another final uh, webinar or, or conference to discuss the, the two sides uh, and uh, probably look more into uh, policy recommendations and options. Um, I really thank uh, everybody for being here, especially the, the panelists, uh, Antonio Bruzzelli from CELIM, uh, Karim El Mufti, the, uh, our uh, researcher there, uh, representative of uh, the human rights movement in, uh, in Beirut, in Lebanon, and professor at La Sages University. Uh, Zeina Mezer from ILO Regional Office in Beirut. Noah Rukos, <laughs> and she's a project awareness officer with 20 years experience at the Caritas Lebanon. Tijiste uh, Kemales, she's a Sussex story from the Ethiopian uh, female community in Lebanon, and she will share with us a few of her, her story, and Mr. Ali El Amin, and uh, he representative of the Syndicate of Recruitment Agencies in Lebanon, and uh, Zeina Mohanna, she's a professor at the American University in Beirut, and uh, um, um, she works in the AMEL Association in the Civic Society Movement for Human Rights. Um, I thank my colleagues uh, from CESPIS in Rome uh, that really work hard for this uh, project and this uh, webinar, Lorenzo Coslovi, Daniele Frigeri and Andrea Stacchiero. Um, I leave the floor now to Antonio to uh, let us know more about this uh, project, uh, Securing Women Migration Cycle, and I really thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Anna. Good morning, everybody. My name is Antonio Buzzelli, and I'm Chalim's uh, head of mission uh, here in Lebanon, uh, and based in Beirut. So the research that will be presented in this webinar, and uh, that was directed by CESPI and in collaboration with uh, La Sagesse University, falls under a three-year project funded by the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation. And it's implemented by, by Chalim uh, here in Lebanon with Caritas, and in Ethiopia with the uh, CVM, and uh, the Ethiopian uh, Catholic Church. The project is entitled Security Women's Migration Cycle and aims to support Ethiopian migrant domestic workers trapped in the Kefala system, helping them to reintegrate in their communities of origin. Um, the initiative has two major components, basically. The first one in Lebanon aims to support Caritas Lebanon's shelters, where former domestic workers take refuge after falling victims to their employer's mistreatment. In these facilities, Caritas does a really an astonishing job in helping the girls overcome the injustices they faced by providing them shelter, protection, medical and uh, psychological support, as well as sensitizing them on uh, the, kef the kefala system. And this is the, the work of Noah. Uh, moreover, Caritas provides them with a specific legal assistance to, to support them throughout their repatriation process. Um, the second leg of the project, the second component, is uh, executed in Ethiopia in partnership with uh, Chief One, which is an Italian NGO that has a long history in, in the country and, uh, as I said, the Ethiopian Catholic Church. Um, there, our partners receive the beneficiaries referred by Caritas Lebanon and provide them with the first assistance they need just before uh, reuniting with their families. Um, in order to facilitate the girls' reintegration in the country and in their communities of origin, vocational trainings and life skill workshops are provided, considering their specific uh, desires, let's say, for the future. Some of the, these girls are also granted with startup capitals to, uh, to start their own commercial activities at, at home. This is uh, done after the, the training, the, the vocational training. And so far, um, we have granted 85 uh, SEPA capitals to, to these girls, so it's a pretty good result, I think. So far, the project has successfully assisted uh, 1,500 women in the Caritas shelter. Among them, uh, there were 887 Ethiopians. And uh, we have repatriated around 
150 Ethiopians and help them reunify with their uh, family back home. Uh, with the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, an estimate of 250,000 migrant domestic workers remain trapped in the country, putting their, their rights and lives more at risk. And with the help of uh, Caritas Lebanon, the project has contributed to the repatriation of uh, 649 returnees a couple of weeks ago. And among, among them, 34 were uh, direct beneficiaries of the project. Uh, they were coming directly from Caritas Shelter. Uh, so this was a, a brief overview of the project. Uh, and I leave the floor to, to Karim uh, for the presentation of the results of the, of the study. Thank you very much. Please, Karim, and thanks to Daniele to share the PowerPoint presentation. Thanks, Karim, to unmute the microphone. There we are. Thanks. Hello, is it everyone? Is the sound clear? Yes, it is. Excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Karim Mufti. I had the uh, Human Rights Legal Clinic at La Sagesse University in Beirut. Um, I was uh, the one handling this, uh, this fascinating report on uh, migration remittances and return for Ethiopian migrant workers in, uh, in Lebanon. Um, as you know, Lebanon is a migration country. It has been for a few decades now, uh, even though this is about to change, as you, as you may have noticed. Uh, Lebanon, uh, for this, has entered the kafala system uh, uh, imported from Gulf countries. And as some Gulf countries are exiting the kafala, Lebanon is very still tied up to it. And this has led to a number of problems and issues. Uh, and, and this report is just one ounce of all the different literature you can find on Lebanon, specifically for migrant domestic workers abuse uh, because of the kafala system. Um, this, uh, this study, like Anna was saying, uh, was done in 2019. So we have data from the authorities from 2018, uh, which counted 156,000 Ethiopian uh, workers in Lebanon. This is an increase by 50% if, uh, in just a few uh, two years, in 2016 and 2018, there was a 50% increase. So from 100,000 registered Ethiopian workers, this is about to change very, very quickly. Yesterday, we had two planes uh, leaving uh, to Ethiopia with migrants uh, on it to go back home because of the crisis. Um, you need to add to the registered uh, migrants who have a formal status in Lebanon, uh, uh, tens of thousands of irregulars or freelancers, those who unfortunately are, are considered outlaws by Lebanese uh, legislation and, and security sector. They uh, are considered as being 50,000 by the General Security Office. Uh, most likely they are, their figure is, is much higher. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see on this tweet, so being a migration country uh, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't work well for Lebanon. Uh, in great racism is one of the issues, uh, like uh, Mrs. Uba Ali had uh, unfortunately witnessed uh, a week ago in Lebanon. Uh, so Lebanon is, is really considered by the literature as uh, quote unquote an injury country, injury country uh, where you're gonna have uh, discrimination, racism and abuse uh, due on uh, this discriminatory or predatory practices from the state, state institutions, so the way the system is structured all the way uh, down to the employers, society as a whole, where you can have a lot of 
uh, aggressivity against foreigners in general and people of color uh, in particular. Next slide. So the ILO has uh, talked many times about the, what we can call triple discrimination, gender, racial, social, uh, and this did not uh, change the tenacity of the kafala system in Lebanon. There's been dozens of campaigns, uh, uh, even an informal union has been constituted. There's a lot of reforms that have been introduced, but the kafala is still there creating a lot of problems. Now the specificity of this study is not re, uh, redirecting uh, uh, critique about the kafala, everybody's doing so. All, all serious studies are talking about the importance of uh, removing the kafala. Uh, the specificity of the study, as you can see from the title, is talking, and you don't have many of these, about the financial management of these workers, of uh, uh, their income. Uh, of course, recalling this is 2019, beginning of 2019. Uh, so we have the chance of having this kind of financial data that we can now compare post-crisis eventually and see how this has impacted the, uh, the financial security of the workers in, in Lebanon, and specifically the Ethiopian community, which is the focus of this uh, study. So this study has looked into remittances, uh, the way the, the workers are, are, are uh, dealing with their income, how much are they being able to save, and what are they doing with the savings, uh, how, how much of the savings are actually turning into remittances back to Ethiopia, and what are these remittances meant for? Is it for helping out the family? Is it for saving? Is it for planning for a project? Is it for planning for their return? Uh, how sustainable is this return? How uh, uh, feasible is the planning? Um, and so we had the chance of, of interviewing uh, 60 uh, Ethiopian workers all over Lebanon. And here I have to thank, of course, uh, three uh, research assistants who, who, who helped us uh, conduct these interviews, uh, Ekubit, also known as Eri, and Niveen, and Hiba, uh, three interviewers who were in the field. Uh, interviewing the 60 uh, workers, three focus groups also, around 30 Ethiopian uh, migrants participated in it, and that helped us gather uh, primary data. I'm going to jump directly to the, the remittances uh, because we don't have much time, and I'm sure our esteemed guests and, and, and lecturers will also be talking about the kafala, and I'll be here to answer any question later on. Um, how do the workers, and specifically the Ethiopian workers, deal with their, with their, with their income, their money? Um, and so from the 60 people interviewed, we could see that a, a, a one third would earn uh, under $200. So these are more junior uh, business scales, everybody knows. Uh, this scale of salary, uh, not really in line with the standard unified contract. Uh, but these are the practices today in Lebanon. 36% or 30% would have more than $350, 36% between $200 and $350, and just a very small minority, mostly freelancers, could go up to $600 by their hard work trying to earn cash for their families. Um, and what would they do with this money? They would actually, uh, uh, for those who have the chance of having employers uh, cover the majority of expenses, uh, the worker, they would actually be able to send as, as, as much as 100% of that money to, uh, to Ethiopia. Unfortunately, we couldn't get data by uh, the money agencies, the transferring agencies, nor by the Bank of Iran, Central Bank. Uh, as you can understand today, the lack of transparency in financial matters is not only related to remittances, it's all over the place. And you know, we understand it more uh, today. This is also is, 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 is a problem. Uh, but they've been sending remittances mostly through Western Union, MoneyGram, uh, and another uh, uh, structure also is sending it through uh, friends going back to Ethiopia uh, uh, in cash, uh, which is something that they, it's, it's a bit you know, harder to trace. Uh, as for the savings, um, well, most of the workers would send uh, uh, the remittances at home either to support for education of their children or siblings, uh, primarily for houses, either building a house, paying for rent, and uh, still, and this is, this is the interesting part of the study, to plan, meaning keeping track of this 
of the savings and they have very creative ways for the workers to track um, the demanding receipts from the bank, they're tracking banking accounts through, uh, through e-banking, uh, asking for, the, for, for uh, WhatsApp uh, receipts. Uh, so this, this means of communication, uh, this global village really allowed the workers to really be on top of, of what is, is being done with their money and try to monitor, not everybody was successful in that, but try to monitor what the family is doing with this money and trying to keep some for their own projects when they go back. And this is very empowering. We could see, we could send, especially in the focus groups, a very high sense of empowerment uh, coming from this pride of being able to try and really make something with this money eventually later using, and this is another source of empowerment thanks to the incredible NGO community in Lebanon, which is the uh, uh, capacity building programs that the migrants, uh, those who have the chance of having the day off or the freelancers or a bit more mobile. Uh, sorry, I'm forgetting there, the slide. Next slide, please. Uh, Karim, excuse me, uh, can you check out your speakers? Because there is a um, background noise and someone was also noticing this. So uh, we can yeah, hear is you. Is it better now? Do you, do you need me to speak louder? Maybe if you speak louder, you can cover this background noise. Let's try this way. Thanks oh, a lot. Oh, there's a noise. Or, there's an okay. Oh, yeah, or uh, the telephone next to the computer, maybe, or something. Uh, Voila. Thanks a lot. Sorry for this interruption. No problem. So, um, so where was I? Yeah. So uh, the the planning uh, the planning for projects and, and the capacity building, uh, the skills, all the different uh, programs that would go on, uh, learning Arabic, learning cooking, learning skills, and the skills would be able. Uh, Plan ahead for doing a uh, manushi snack, uh, for experience or, uh, or daycares uh, or, or shops, um, or, or using the Arabic they've learned to open specifically Lebanese snacks because now they know how to cook uh, and attract Arab and Lebanese diaspora there and the children. Um, so this is this is what this used to be very uh, gratifying, used to be very positive. Of course, not all the workers we interviewed had these kind of, 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 of possibility. A lot. Had a lot of reviews, witnessing reviews, and like you can see here, with kafala as an entrapment process, there's a lot of human trafficking involved. Uh, workers are considered as merchandise; you can just throw away. And what's happening today in the uh, in the vicinity of the of the embassy in Hasminia, for instance, where every day you have groups of workers just being abandoned there by employers, uh, is is is, is a scam. Um, so it's a wide door to abuse. There's the security mindset behind it that the, all the campaigns we're talking about that is throwing the responsibility of, you know, uh, keeping an eye on the foreigners to the families, to the sponsor, to the employer, which also is not a very dignifying uh, aspect of labor. Next slide, please. And so this, uh, this migration journey that, uh, that uh, the, the, the migrants from Ethiopia would endure, uh, we, we had the, also the possibility of of really retracing the journey with the, with the workers and seeing from, from their village or their uh, uh, city in Ethiopia, how would they actually reach uh, Lebanon? And here we identified uh, what we could call a knowledge gap for departure. Different factors here, uh, not everyone. There is a program by the Ethiopian authorities, by local communities about preparing you know, workers going to specific countries like Lebanon, for instance, but not everybody can access these kind of programs. It's more concentrated in the capital. Uh, those coming from other regions do not have access to it. So they, they go to Lebanon, they don't know what to expect, they don't know the language, and then they get trapped by the employer system with a very asymmetrical relation with the employer where they cannot actually, well, breach the contract. They cannot change employer. They are at, really at the, uh, at the pleasure, they serve at the pleasure of the employer, unfortunately. And the ban that had been set by the Ethiopian authorities is being ignored by Lebanese authorities, where the general security would tell us that it's not their uh, responsibility to enforce a ban from the Ethiopian uh, authorities. And it is the responsibility of the workers to know what they are expecting when they come 
to Lebanon. And so this, this, this entrapment, of course, will slide these workers into this irregular status. And of course, and many of the freelancers today, because of hyperinflation, because of lack of work, because of COVID-19, they cannot go from house to house to clean the houses or to uh, render services. People had closed their homes because of the coronavirus. And so these, these, these persons were really literally in a very dire humanitarian situation uh, and, and, and could not pay rent, could not pay for food, could not really survive. Uh, and a lot of humanitarian uh, uh, efforts were done in the past months uh, on, this, on this level. Next slide, please. And so coming back on the remittances, which is today uh, a problem, uh, there's, there's very different uh, uh, factors we've noticed, as I, as I explained, very disparate financial practices. Some would be able to save, others would be able to plan. Uh, some had planned, Lebanon would not be the first journey, it would be the second or the third. They would have savings, they go back home, the project doesn't work, they lose the money, they, get, they have to go back, pressured by the family to work again and to send, uh, to send money back. Uh, so it's very precarious, uh, even the projection, the planning doesn't always work out, but we have to give it, uh, give to them the, the tenacity they have about uh, uh, wanting to move uh, forward. Uh, next slide. So the impact, and I don't want to take more time, I think my time is up. Um, the impact of the financial and COVID-19 uh, crisis here, uh, of course, a staggering situation. Uh, here you have uh, some photos in front of the embassy of girls who were just abandoned there. Uh, thank you, Luna Safon, for Twitter for those photos that I am uh, sharing. Uh, obviously, the, the, the workers have lost up to 75% even more of the value of their income. They're being paid in Lebanese lira at the normal rates. Patients transferring money, and if they want to access cash and dollars, they have to pay. Up today, it's up to five thousand lira per, per dollar, and it's 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 really a problem. Meaning the remittance flow from Lebanon to Ethiopia has really dried up. Uh, so you can imagine the psychological strain on these workers at home, freelancers, or in the streets here. Uh, 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 doing uh, uh, sit-ins uh, because they have no longer place to go. They've been uh, uh, handled by uh, NGOs like Caritas and, and Amel. Ministry of Labor had uh, taken in, 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 in charge one group, the very first group, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's very problematic. There is no solution yet for these uh, persons who are strained, stranded, uh, next slide please, who are stranded in Lebanon. Uh, this is a, a snapshot from the Ethiopian airline uh, services. And you can see how much they were charging because they want to charge the quarantine also on the girls, on the workers. I think this has changed uh, since then, which is a good thing because yesterday two planes went back to Ethiopia with, uh, with workers. Uh, the problem is those who are not uh, registered, those who are not regular, uh, the problem is the, 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 the workers who are working basically for free. So we already had cases where salaries were not being paid, uh, 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 not forgetting all the sexual or moral harassment. But here the financial problematic is uh, actually uh, real, real uh, not, it's not only modern, it's real slavery here where the salary you are going to pay doesn't cover anything. And a lot of employers don't want to go into that immoral and, and unethical uh, treatment. So they want the girls to leave. They're ready to pay for their tickets. But don't forget, COVID-19 also hit us. Borders were closed. Airport were closed. And uh, uh, as the airport will be opening back in July 1st, uh, it's been two or three months where these girls had to really live health to health. They had a lot of suicide happening, a lot of psychological uh, uh, problems uh, from uh, people that were uh, helped by NGOs, sometimes picked up in the streets. Uh, we can remember one Nigerian worker who was completely disoriented uh, on the highway and she was picked up by an NGO. Um, so very, very high, uh, 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 high uh, dosage of, of, of issues here when it comes to domestic workers in Lebanon. So the recommendations here, um, 
next slide, please. Uh, the last one is obviously to uh, to use that window that we have today to really end the kafala and the which obviously is not working. There's a problem since the beginning of the journey, in the middle of the journey, at the end of the journey, there's a set of problems that uh, no small measures, which has been the, uh, the, uh, the policy of the Lebanese authorities, small measures in there, this does not cut. Kafala has to end. And uh, uh, today we have a window for this as activists, as human rights defenders, uh, we need to support this. Uh, more presently, um, we need to uh, repatriate uh, all workers, Ethiopian and other from other nationalities, uh, as, as, as early as possible. We need to free them from the entrapment. We need to free them. We need to free the employers also, who have, who have many cannot afford, in, from a good faith point of view, they cannot afford uh, paying their, 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 uh, their worker today neither in Lebanese lira or in, or in dollar. Even the, the regular rate is, is becoming a problem for those who have lost half their salaries or even their, their whole salaries as a household. Um, so we need to uh, find solutions for them to be repatriated in coordination with the embassies. We need to get central bank involved for the, for the workers to get full payment of their dues in dollars. This is a national responsibility. We brought them here. We decided to ignore the ban from Ethiopian authorities. We decided to organize standard contracts Notarized, meaning legalized by the, by, the, by the authorities of Lebanon, meaning we need to honor this. And access to dollars is a problem for the employers. It's not uh, their own responsibility alone. The national authorities need to step in and also provide uh, dollars for the girls leaving because it is their, uh, it is their right that they have worked for this uh, and they need to take this back home with them. Uh, so the repatriation needs to be Uh, need to preserve the workers' dignity with good use, and and as uh, has been the rule so far. In, in, uh, in addition to this, of course, we arranging the, the work relation between the employer and the, and the worker uh, on the basis of new terms. Uh, just want to point out to a proposal by a few embassy representatives yesterday uh, that were mentioning you know, the introduction of a new contract. Uh, this needs to be debated also. I'm sure it's going to disturb a nice debate, uh, but the, the utmost urgency here today is repatriation in, dig in dignifying conditions and ending the government. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Karim, for this um, presentation. I, I know it's always difficult to um, squeeze up uh, complex issues as uh, in this case for um, human dignity, human rights, uh, uh, repatriation and uh, um, labor conditions. So uh, I really thank you and I think you, you really mentioned many aspects that will be um, picked up by our panelists in terms of uh, responsibilities um, and the scenario of uh, actors that are all involved, uh, private actors, governments, uh, employers, and uh, uh, workers. So um, I give the floor to Noah Rukos um, from uh, Caritas uh, Lebanon uh, that, um, as mentioned before, uh, Caritas Lebanon is also partner in, uh, in the project uh, and uh, is in the front line in um, in, in this emergency, but uh, generally in dealing with uh, um, migrants in, in Lebanon and uh, also uh, in dealing with uh, uh, the fragilities and vulnerabilities of uh, uh, domestic migrant domestic workers. So if Noah is available, she can uh, uh, start talking, make sure uh, we don't have this uh, um, background noise. <laughs> uh, hope it works. So uh, you have uh, 10 minutes to go. Please go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, I just changed uh, from, I was Karim Mufti and now I came back as Noah. <laughs> we had the issue with the electricity. So can you hear me? Perfectly, perfectly. Okay. So, uh, as also Caritas uh, been partner of Chile, with Chilean since uh, a long time, 
and we've been uh, implementing many activities in Lebanon and in Ethiopia, and they've been a big support for uh, Caritas and the migrant workers, especially the Ethiopian. Uh, so I will introduce what's going on and things that they are the, now in the momentum. Like we had the economic crisis that came along and uh, the COVID-19, and they are now like the opportunity to make the change and to abolish the kafala system that has been keeping both the employer and employee stuck with the, this system that enforced the modern slavery. Uh, as Caritas and as me, as social worker and uh, awareness officer since 20 years in uh, Caritas, uh, we received the first group of the Ethiopian women that they when uh, they were uh, stuck in front of the embassy and uh, it was in a way that inhuman to let them this way without any money anything uh, uh, even it took time for the embassy to move and take a decision what she would do about those women uh, and they are responsible first uh, for them they were 37 women and there were uh, two of them that they had mental uh, mental illness. So uh, they are now waiting in our shelters till their situation be solved first with their employer to go uh, make sure that they receive their salaries and not to go away, uh, go back home without getting their rights. Uh, different than the two flights that they went away and uh, to yesterday they were uh, all with the, it was their decision to go home with the consent of their employer and after all the efforts and uh, the uh, NGOs efforts to take out the payment of the confinement uh, for each day of your stay in Ethiopia for 14 days. So uh, besides only not only the Ethiopian that we are we are working with more than 25 uh, nationals in the same circumstances of uh, being stuck, uh, especially the one uh, that they are living outside uh, their employer house or the one that they are working as freelancer. And as Dr. Karim mentioned, that they are uh, considered as undocumented. Mm -hmm. So they are they're at risk at any moment of being arrested. Uh, and uh, they are suffering now for not being able to work even. They were working by, and paid by the hour. And now the, no, no employer is letting them inside their homes because they are afraid of the COVID-19. And some of them, they also they are married and they have their families and they, ha they have mixed marriage between like Sudanese, Ethiopian, Egyptian, Ethiopian. And they are not uh, having this uh, access to go back home because the, also they, uh, they, they, are, they, have, they want to go as a family and there is no support from any embassy or uh, they want to stay even in Lebanon because they've been here since long time and they don't want to go back home because they didn't have any uh, preparation for their uh, reintegration once they are home. And this is the issue of remittance. Many of the migrants, they were like sending money back home to their families, but they didn't think about their future there. They didn't imagine that one day that they would have this crisis and they have to go back home without anything. They didn't have their houses uh, already there. Uh, even they didn't put money aside. So even in Lebanon, they didn't put money aside or in their country and all the money, most of the money were spent already. Once they got it, they spent. So uh, they didn't have this remittance well organized. And this is a, the most important issue that every migrant worker should be prepared for the reintegration and going one day home because Lebanon is not a country where you get the nationality. So uh, it's not a country of migration. It's like you stay for a while and you go back home. So uh, this is a, uh, the awareness issue that women should also learn about the preparation and to get ready to go back home one day and have the remittance organized or used in a way that they have something back home once they decide to uh, to go and with the COVID-19 and the economic crisis now it's became like 
they are forced to go back home because they don't have any more salaries for men and women also men are also facing the same issue as migrants as they are not also receiving their salaries and uh, the factories or the stations that they were working on, on they are closed now and they are not paid so uh, and uh, within uh, we as caritas we launched like this week uh, a campaign on ending kafala system and uh, putting the Lebanese in the shoes of the migrant workers and what they feel when their rights are not really uh, respected. So the domestic workers are workers at, as anyone. And yesterday was also the 16th uh, June, the Domestic Workers Day. So uh, there is lots of lack uh, in all these uh, issues. And uh, we had many women that they are, are facing like mental uh, problems because of the situation. They are not like, uh, they don't uh, believe the employer that the, the airports are closed and uh, some of them, they see their families, what they are facing. They are not able to com communicate with them. This is making the life of the migrants worse and, uh, and worse. Uh, but uh, if we don't choose now, the momentum of the, to make the change and take this opportunity to abolish this kafala and let those women be as any worker and retrieve the status of being stuck in a house and not being able to be living outside and coming to work this eight hours and going back to their home. They are mature adults. They are responsible for themselves. So this is the most important issue. And as Caritas, we are doing lots of efforts, working uh, on empowering the, uh, the communities to take the lead and to be responsible for themselves and their communities. And we are trying to support them, support them with all the capacities that we can. Now we have more than thousands of migrants that they are stuck here. They are in need of humanitarian assistance which they are not able uh, to cover uh, their uh, basic needs. And uh, also we can speak for the employers, they are also suffering from their side too, but uh, the migrants uh, do not have any anyone to support them, no families, no, even their money cannot be sent, but in dollar and they are not able to take dollars. So this is a big problem for all the, the migrants, especially the Ethiopian, as they are the largest number in Lebanon. And uh, it was still increasing till the, uh, this, when we have the airport closed, we had the last group arriving, but we were having more and more Ethiopian coming. And uh, the support from the side of Ethiopia was not uh, really strong with the ban. It wasn't effective from the start. So instead of letting the migrants have less number of the Ethiopian coming to Lebanon, they were becoming more and more through other routes. And even they, been, they were a victim of human trafficking in many uh, countries before re reaching Lebanon. So the remittance is the in all this study, the most important was is that the women understand and believe in themselves and prepare themselves when they go back home and uh, not to just send their money and not prepare as they are back home. And when Dr. Karim mentioned the, that some women, they were sending money with their friends, some of those friends, they weren't really providing the money to the family. Some of them, they were not giving at all the money back to the family. So this is also a big uh, uh, problem and obstacle that they could be facing when they send back uh, their money back home. Uh, so this is an example of what we are having. Like this 37 women, they are one of the examples that we are seeing today. And they had more women coming in front of the embassy, another group, uh, uh, another NGO maybe were handling them. I don't know who took uh, in charge the other group who reached also the doors of the embassy. But those women now, they are stuck till their situation is solved and uh, they could be going back home safe and having uh, their rights. Because this is the most important, that they don't leave empty-handed despite all what they are facing in Lebanon. And thank you.
Thank you very much, Noah, for uh, um, sharing the experience from uh, Caritas Lebanon and especially your observatory from today's situation that uh, is addressing to the need to change the kafala system, but also to um, help uh, uh, migrants to prepare uh, their return and also to secure the, their money or their remittances. So, um, uh, as you were mentioning also these 37 women in front of the embassy and this, uh, we have the, um, the voice and the experience uh, of a, a representative of the Ethiopian female community in uh, Beirut or in Lebanon, uh, Tijeste, uh, that is, uh, um, as mentioned before, she's a successful story of uh, integration, a businesswoman in uh, Lebanon, but uh, uh, she knows a lot of other unsuccessful stories. So she she can share uh, some of these elements uh, with us. Uh, just for the people that joined the, the webinar um, uh, quite recently, let's say, uh, you have the opportunity to put uh, questions in the Q&A section. So you can write um, questions there and address them to the different panelists or share your comments or um, uh, the points of view. Uh, we will go back to these questions at the end of the um, panelist group. So uh, please, Tijiste, uh, if you could uh, take the floor, that's yours. Uh, I think it's. She's with uh, Zaina Mohanna. Just a second. Uh, can you please uh, allow the, my, uh, the video because I think it's closed. Sure. Uh, Daniela, do you mind? Okay, there it is. Yeah. Thanks so a lot. I guess to go in. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. We can hear you well. Thanks a lot. Go ahead, please. Okay, my name is Tagusta Shemandes from Ethiopia. Uh, for 13 years for uh, Lebanon, for uh, eight years on Amal, Amal Association. My girl, Maheda. Sorry, I'm not very really good to speak English. Sorry. Uh, Lita. Uh, I have a lot of problem now in Lebanon. The first corona, before the Lebanon, you have you no know, problem, don't have dollar. Uh, now it is big problem for dollar. Uh, I can give um, relationship uh, for girls money. Go out yani, when you keep a row. See problem a lot, you know how to I say with all. I say also for uh, Caritas, you know how. Phoebe children also want the ban on tea problem. You know, for paper problem, for uh, school problem, uh, a lot of. I have me also, I have boy. It's problem, and a lot of things from in Lebanon. I can't uh, very well make, uh, I can't, I mean, don't have very well speak English. When you come in the girls to Banon, when you work, when you change your foreign life, but uh, now you don't have a dollar, I can't work. And, it's very a problem when you come, when you join for your family, uh, or when you family help, when you also for whom life change. Have children, have husband, have family, everyone, and when you come, when you change life. But when you come here, it is very dangerous. I'm not uh, problem language, problem. Uh, Lot of things, but no problem. It's dollar. Don't have dollar when you go or when you are welcome for the country. Fourteen days uh, keep 
hotel, we don't have a dollar. Only Lebanon people are coming. I can give money. It's a big problem for God. And it's like this. Yeah, if you allow me to ask, because I know Tigist has been there for a good eight years and she has been really remarkable in identifying um, cases that were abused, that we uh, tried together to support an AMAL association, victims of violence, being sexual and other issues. And she is even telling me uh, that, um, uh, she's even telling me that, uh, unfortunately now, there are ladies and there are some organized uh, ladies from their community who are getting these ladies into quote unquote uh, prostitution due to this uh, crisis to uh, access some funds. So it can go uh, that extreme. So the situation, especially with the COVID has been really very difficult. Uh, as a person like uh, Tigis, who has been really a success story in terms of migration, she had her own business. If you can tell them about what did you do before, because you started with domestic work with a family and yeah. then you moved on your own. What have you done before? Before I have uh, my work, uh, was, uh, I have uh, worked in salon, I have a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I have it's good. Thanks, Yanni, for the uh, Lebanon people. Now. I have work. Now it's very problem. I don't have, uh, no, I close everything. I can't do nothing. Don't have work. My husband also here. So, uh, no work. My clothes, my my restaurant, my salon, and clothes. I have baby. I'm just at home. Thanks. Yeah, because uh, Tigist really she decided at some point to come to Lebanon and. Uh, Actually, I'll, I'll tell you later that we visited Ethiopia together and we met all the counterparts uh, when I'm going to intervene. Um, but she decided to bring her family and her husband is here uh, and she has a, a son. And we know that uh, the situation of children is very difficult in Lebanon because they are not properly registered and the migrants don't know about all these legal uh, 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 status. And her husband was brought through a recruiting agency that charged thousands of dollars. And now they're uh, even uh, uh, asking for more money and threatening and other issues that are not ethical. So here is the door of abuse of human trafficking that could open among the uh, recruiting agency and that are not regularized. So all of the sector requires really more support where the migrants are vulnerable. Um, but you were telling me to guess, about the ladies who were thrown in the street by the employer. What is your intake on that? The ladies that were thrown from the party. Uh, I'm bringing just uh, also my house because I, you know, Nina Tari, I'm bringing my home one week. So I'm not going to eat. I help. And one I can. And when I see a, a road, a girl, I can't leave. I'm bringing her my home, I help for her. Yeah, yeah. so she, she accommodated uh, some of the ladies at her own place that are uh, also faced with the legal status uh, and who are uh, trying to follow their fight for voluntary return. Mm -hmm. So also we can see that the community, and this is something uh, that we have seen now, there is beautiful solidarity between the community themselves in a time where embassies are not uh, as cooperative as uh, requested. Um, what do you think are the um, uh, migrants, most of them, what are they thinking? They want to stay here or they want to leave? Me? You and the other migrants, yeah. No, um, Lebanon, uh, but more uh, leave, it's problem, no dollar. Uh, me, I can leave Lebanon. I can leave Lebanon. I can't go to Tokyo. It's a big problem, really. Uh, I don't know why, but it's a big problem. It's for girls also. When I'm in Lebanon here, uh, I don't have work. I'm not dollar. When you give for Lebanon money, uh, it's a big problem. Yeah. And I believe in Islam, I'm not going to be a big problem. Yeah, 
um, uh, Tigis is one of the uh, cases that are uh, on a regular status, uh, already registered with a family that she used to work at their place, but now uh, uh, trying to conduct her own uh, business, which is at some point was being pressured and we as a civil society and INGOs were trying to push to regularize the freelancer sector. But now we can hear from them, uh, many of them, that they want to leave to Europe uh, and some of them already filed resettlement files uh, to request to go to another country where they can uh, get more prosperity because many of them um, can't see that in the coming future there are jobs. Knowing that in Lebanon now the lockdown uh, just almost ended yesterday. Um, so hoping for economic crisis to uh, kick up a bit. But definitely many migrants are set at the jeopardy. And um, as you heard, she's saying that they don't even have the money to pay their rent uh, and to get food. And we and the Hamel Association have been receiving on a daily basis the request to access for uh, food items. So which is really saddening at this stage for people who were, like her case, very successful and was able to launch her own businesses of having a salon. And she had a business of distributing the injera, which is the Ethiopian food, etc. Thank you for I'm an association for uh, for learn for everything it helps to just eight years old. I'm an association or uh, maybe uh, uh, exam. Uh, thank you for I'm an association. It's like a family for all Ethiopian girls. When you feel problem, when you help, when you go to Ethiopia, also for paper, problem, everything help. Thank you for Amal Association. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Tigist, uh, for your um, uh, experience that you share with us and your contribution. And uh, what you said is very important because uh, it tells us that um, there is a humanitarian need to help uh, uh, migrants and women stuck now in Lebanon, but also what the Zaina Mohana was telling us that uh, we have to look at the future. Uh, wh wh where are these people wanting to go? So back to Ethiopia or somewhere else in Lebanon or in other mi um, migrant trajectories. So we really need to um, see what is happening now and help these people, but also consider what will happen in the future. So the next plans for these people and helping them. So um, we welcome Zeyna Mezer from ILO um, Lebanon uh, Bay Re Regional Office in Beirut. So thanks for being here. So um, for you, the floor to uh, pick up from other um, discussion and presenters and uh, for you, Zeyna. Thank you, Anna. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, I'm glad to see many friends and colleagues uh, in the participant uh, list. Today, we're still celebrating the International Domestic Workers Day, uh, which was yesterday. And um, hopefully next year, like now, we will be celebrating real achievements of uh, reform and recognition of domestic work uh, as work uh, in Lebanon and also beyond Lebanon. Um, and thank you, uh, Karim and Dina, for the uh, research that uh, you have shared and uh, presented the findings. What I will try to do is um, simply link the recommendations that you have clearly mentioned in the research to the structural issues uh, around kafala reform. Um, because although today in Lebanon, we are living definitely a crisis situation and uh, the crisis is not just related to COVID, it is related also to the economic crisis. And uh, there are discussions that Lebanon might move into being considered a humanitarian uh, country because of uh, the multitude of problems that are happening now. So the migrant workers problem would be and is one of so many other problems that um, uh, UN agencies and the governments and NGOs are trying to deal with. But all these problems do highlight one thing and they highlight the structural problems at the heart of labor migration uh, approach uh, in Lebanon, which is precisely the kafala. Um, if I can, 
ask uh, Anna or Daniela if she can share the second slide uh, of my uh, presentation. Um, in, so far, people do use the term kafala, but it became like a jargon. Like, what, what is really kafala? So because we are working on dismantling kafala, we did a lot of effort with uh, partner, uh, partners from NGOs and also from the government in order to come up with a very clear approach how we can dismantle the system that is affecting hundreds of thousands of lives. So first of all, we have to take note that kafala is not a law. It's not a very clearly defined system. It's, uh, it's not a single, it's conceived as a single law or um, practices, regulations that are intertwined policies and customs. And definitely it governs a foreign workforce. Uh, what characterizes kafala at its core is that it's a heavily unbalanced employer and migrant worker relationship. Moving to the next slide, why is kafala problematic? If we look at labor migration in all countries, the first question is whether into a country is tied to a specific employer through a work or residency permit is something that is applicable to most countries in the world, right? You cannot just go and travel and work in a country without having um, a, uh, a job offer and tied to a certain employer. Kafara is problematic because here are five questions and in Lebanon, the answer to the first four questions is yes. In Lebanon, to come and work in Lebanon, the worker has to be a specific employer in order to get a work permit and a residency permit. The renewal of stay in the country through the residency permit is the responsibility of the employer, while we know that if the worker uh, fails to obtain uh, a renewal of their residency, they risk detention and deportation while the employer only risks to pay penalty. And so it's beyond the control of the worker to preserve their uh, legal stay in the country. The termination of employment requires the approval of the first employer. And this is the heart, actually, the core of the problem. And changing from one employer to another would also require the, appro uh, the approval of the first employer. There's a fifth question that is applicable to some other countries and is no longer applicable to Lebanon, which makes kafala problematic and is whether uh, eggs from the country requires approval of the employer or not. This has been lifted in Lebanon a few years ago. Now kafala, as it stands, it, it's applicable to all migrant workers, but even refugees who may have access to uh, also fall under the kafala. But our discussion today it focuses only on migrant domestic workers. But this is to say that the kafala, the sponsorship system, is something that governs the whole labor migration in Lebanon. In today's, in today's time where there are so many challenges facing um, policy making and the urgent need to address immediate and basic needs from food and shelter and uh, prevention of COVID, is there an opportunity to address these structural problems? This is a big question. We have been trying um, to work on kafala. We used to say abolish kafala, change kafala, dismantle kafala, whatever you want to name it. But we have been trying on changing the system for even before the adoption of Convention 189 in 2011 but very heavily since 2011. And many of the partners, um, CSOs are present uh, among the participants who have been advocating for this change. Last year, in, um, during the, uh, uh, in April, the Ministry of Labor established a working group to come up with a comprehensive vision on dismantling kafala with practical measures, very practical, that the Minister of Labour can alone adopt uh, without the need to go to the Parliament or that's the Council of the Minister. So we work on parallel paths and try to start the change. This was during the former um, government. 
who the, the, their minister of, minister of labor uh, admitted that kafala is a modern slavery relationship. And this is important because, again, it highlights the importance of policymakers recognizing the problem in the system and academics and researchers and uh, NGOs and uh, activists. So in uh, August, we presented the vision on Natalie Kafala, which entails uh, working on recruitment modalities that would also allow live out and part-time work and not just live in. This is also the domestic work is work, which means covering it under the labor uh, law. Um, extend protection to social security protection to migrant workers, work on uh, labor protection, uh, wage uh, protection mechanism, reinforce a speedy complaint uh, mechanism and uh, uh, interfering of the judiciary in an effective way and not where, where we see today that some court cases take ages and often are done in absentia. So all of these uh, elements, I'm not gonna go into full details about them, uh, but happy to do so after the questions, have been pre an action plan. And the concrete um, uh, piece of the puzzle that we decided to work on was to revise the standard unified contract. Uh, most of you know that to come to Lebanon as a domestic worker, the worker and the employer do sign a contract. And the issue of the contract is also mentioned in the recommendation of the presentation. There are two issues around the contract. First, we have the problem of co contract substitution. In Ethiopia, for example, the worker we have uh, would sign something with recruitment agencies and will have different expectations from the contract that they will sign in Lebanon with them. And that creates a lot of conflict and uh, weakens the possibility for protection. So one thing is to, we were advocating that it should be one contract. The worker should be able to uh, see and agree on all the articles of the contract before they decide uh, to uh, migrate and uh, agree on the job. And this same contract will be signed upon uh, arrival to Lebanon. And this contract will also be the base for the bilateral uh, agreements. You also mentioned in the study the importance of bilateral agreements. And um, I may not have the time to go in full details about this, but there's very sensitivities around bilateral agreements unless it's fully comprehensive and respects the right of the workers. As ILO, we approach workers irrespective of nationality. So the whole discrimination based on nationality should not make its way into the bilateral agreements when it comes to uh, labor rights. Uh, the wage issues should not be linked to um, uh, nationality. Uh, being allowed uh, 15 days paid leave should not be linked to a uh, Recognizing the need for rest and uh, days off and be free to use this time outside the house should not be linked the power of uh, government to negotiate. This should be common to all migrant domestic workers. So all of these issues, we inserted them in this proposed standard unified contract, which is now again being uh, studied by the Ministry of Labor. And on Friday, we have a meeting to again uh, discuss it and see what the progress on this. The standard unified contract on its own is a weak instrument. It doesn't mean much. It's important if it's linked to a proper complaint mechanism and a full awareness campaign to the workers and the employers and recruitment agencies and embassies around all these articles. Because in this new revised uh, standard unified contract, we address all elements of forced labor. So what I started by explaining the uh, problems around kafala, not being able to resign from their job is something that is addressed. So the whole termination of contract with notice and without notice is uh, non-payment of wages being uh, a reason to terminate the contract uh, immediately by the worker is there and it's addressed. Uh, the confiscation of passport um, uh, is there. So all the elements that we know from research and evidence and from the voices of migrant uh, workers uh, are reflected in this contract, which eventually we hope, even if the Domestic work will be covered by the labor law, and this is also a, a serious discussion that is happening. We, we still need these type of contracts between an employer and the workers, because you know these employers are not an institutions and businesses who are 
familiar with contracts, you need to redefine this relationship, which over the years has been perceived as, you know, it's, it's not a job, it's something anyone can do working in a house. So we are redefining this relationship also through this contract. Having said that, there might be the whole uh, economic crisis and COVID crisis might be an opportunity to introduce these changes because this is becoming like uh, a situation that is unbearable for the migrant workers. It was unbearable for a long time for the migrant workers, but now they are also finding themselves on the streets. But also the government is looking for uh, measures like what to do about this. Our very clear message is continuing to be work on the structural changes. We don't want um, to see like just ad hoc remedies where we don't recognize the heart of the problems. And this is where collectively and the voices of everyone who is involved in this is very important. On one hand, to highlight us what gaps, whereas the advocacy message uh, might go wrong and take us backward because there is that risk as well to have very superficial reform will be a step backward. So we're, we're very uh, open to discussion and engage in a dialogue in order to see how we can make use of this crisis to push for the reform. At the same time, we are understanding the challenges. The dollar crisis is a challenge, but despite this challenge, we know, and I think uh, Ali Amin is uh, with us today, uh, we know that some perhaps recruitment agencies might go, might go and try to identify countries that will accept lower working conditions and lower uh, salaries. So the whole vicious circle of exploitation of migrant domestic workers will continue. It will change the name of the country, but it will change into other countries. And this is very sensitive and we have to work on this. Um, one last thing, which is also related to uh, remittances and to all what's happening on the discussion on, of the return of the migrant workers, it's very important at stage to focus uh, the advocacy messages on voluntary return. We need to have a very clear uh, voice for the migrant domestic workers or the migrant workers, whether they want to go back home, it's their right, if so. And again, this is where we need to engage more with both governments to, to facilitate this voluntary return. But the voluntary return should not be on the expense of the labor rights. If there are unpaid wages or other type of labor claims, today the domestic workers who may uh, want to leave Lebanon uh, might risk giving up on all these claims. So we are trying to brainstorm over a practical structure that will facilitate the return to those who want to go back home without jeopardizing their uh, labor rights. Some of them have months of unpaid wages. Some may have years of unpaid wages and the claims may be also beyond unpaid wages. So this is also a, a very uh, important point. Uh, I'm not gonna go very much into details around it, but uh, I would also uh, hope whoever is interested to discuss more on this issue, you can uh, write your name on the chat or uh, send an email, you can have a brainstorming uh, over it. I'm gonna stop here and thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, glad to see that most of the recommendations in the papers are in line um, with the uh, actions that we are taking. So uh, it shows that everyone is kind of uh, tuned on the same wavelength. Let's hope that policymakers would be as tuned as us uh, to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zeina. And um, just to answer to some requests from the audience, uh, um, if you all agree, we will share the, the documents and the PowerPoints presentation for everybody that is interested on this. We, um, we have a, a question that we'll uh, pick up uh, uh, later on from uh, Aida, from Awell, from uh, the, the attendees uh, group. And what Zeina told us is also um, very much 
online in line with the uh, the the research findings from uh, um, and the recommendations from uh, uh, Karin, but also from what also Noah and other panelists told us. So uh, there is a, uh, an opportunity in the COVID and the crisis. Uh, a very negative happening could represent, in fact, uh, an opportunity to change the the kafala system and uh, provide uh, labor and human rights to uh, domestic workers or migrant workers uh, more generally. And and also the importance to involve all different stakeholders uh, uh, in both countries, I would say so, is a very transnational um, problem managed in, um, with, with the engagement of different uh, um, subjects, civic society, government, uh, recruitment agencies, uh, migrants and uh, uh, families and employers. So please, uh, Zeina Mohanna from uh, the American University in Beirut and Amel Association, uh, the floor is yours also to comment on other uh, inputs that you received during this um, very interesting discussion. Please. Okay, great. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everybody. I want to join my voice again. And really one reflection is that people working in the support of migrant domestic workers in Lebanon really have been there, uh, really committed for this file. Uh, all these panelists really, I think we're all gathering efforts and now in times of crisis, we're even getting closer to uh, put up our resources together. Yeah, as you said, um, I am with, uh, I, I uh, teach at the American University of Beirut, human rights and other issues where migrant workers come always on top. And at the same time, I've been, I had established this program since around the decade in Amal Association International. Um, uh, in the support of migrants where we're doing several uh, issues where uh, I will definitely highlight it. Just to add on my colleagues uh, and uh, partners and friends, um, and thank you for hosting this uh, session. Uh, a little bit more of some maybe practical and more numbers on the ground that could highlight the uh, uh, issues. Uh, I don't want to repeat much of what I said, but just to highlight that migrants currently are estimated to 182,000 regular and 60,000 irregular, which accounts to almost 6% of the total uh, population before the Syrian uh, crisis, which is not a number that could be underestimated. And definitely this category of freelancers uh, or um, irregulars are the ones being jeopardized the most within the current situation. Uh, modern slavery is what we highlighted. Um, definitely, this is an issue that no country should accept to be there. Uh, but definitely, Lebanon is not among the worst countries, but there, because there is freedom of expression. So that's why uh, Lebanon is always highlighted on the news. But this definitely is an opportunity to bring up the migrant uh, domestic workers' rights and to, to address it forward. The kafala, as we know it, is not um, written law. It's a customary law. Uh, which it makes it even harder to address it because this is what is practiced, so the change is harder and an alternative is needed. In Lebanon, we're speaking around 13, uh, almost 13 nationalities, um, highest coming to Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Philippines, and Nepal, among others, um, Western Africa uh, and other countries. But definitely uh, there are some bands that were there. Uh, and that makes it uh, challenging for these ladies, especially that we know that some go into some smuggling or human trafficking routes that makes it harder for them to reach Lebanon or deception by signing a contract there and the contract here. And also there is the role of the sorting agencies that uh, should uh, ensure that the migrants are not deceived and there is a, um, a good relationship between employer and employee. The main four categories that we could highlight in terms of abuse or challenge are uh, exploitation in terms of decent conditions of work, uh, violence in all its types, physical, mental, sexual, uh, psychological, discrimination, and where also racism would fall. Uh, and um, actually the highlight of uh, Karim that he gave us about Uba Ali. Uba is my student at AUB. She's a top student, really uh, of very high intelligence uh, activist and she uh, aspires to become a president in her own country. And here we treat her as a migrant worker and asking for her madame. So I think that this perspective needs to be changed. Um, and uh, to add on uh, exploitation, violence, and discrimination, I would add trafficking. So, and this is something that needs increased identification. 
Uh, among the main uh, problems that are uh, highlighted where we've been all gathering efforts, um, civil society and other uh, counterparts is first there is a language barrier. So the lack of uh, communication is a door uh, to open uh, for abusers. Cultural difference where there is need to respect more both sides and everybody uh, respecting the other's culture. The legal status, we know migrants are not subject to Article 7 and the labor law, so whatever violence or challenge that they are subject to are, um, there is no legal document that uh, preserves their rights. The, there is a need for mechanism of payment of wages. Also, uh, many routes were uh, high, uh, suggested, opening a bank account, uh, which is challenging for them. Uh, it was explored to have an Ethiopian bank coming here. Also, it was not very profitable for them. Um, it has been tried in Jordan also. It wasn't, very, it wasn't been very effective, but no doubt that we need to find a way to ensure that they are paid all their salaries before they leave. Uh, other uh, challenges are uh, being definitely victims uh, of abuse. Uh, civil society is really limited in terms of uh, capacity to support so even before the crisis and what about now? So we're speaking about limited shelter capacity uh, we have many of the irregulars that don't have health insurance where uh, there is a hit and run and sometimes we're faced with cases that uh, uh, require medical support that uh, NGOs are not able to support. Uh, we know that uh, migrant workers come on a shorter contract and then if they decide to have a family, their children, um, uh, they stay here but they can't have a legal access and even they have problems to access schools. Um, uh, in addition to the request of safe recruitment pathways, so this needs to be in coordination with countries of origin. Uh, in addition for the need to uh, make sure that all this migration cycle is, is organized uh, from going from the countries of origin where there is training, there is a bit of um, uh, language orientation, uh, the cultural challenge that is addressed from both sides, etc. All of these are issues that need to be on the ground to ensure that this migration happen in an uh, effective manner. Uh, in terms of, I know you said this focus on Ethiopia, uh, in specific Ethiopia had set a ban um, for all uh, uh, Arab countries, but there was a specific ban for Lebanon even from before. Uh, and this uh, was not lifted. Uh, we got the chance to visit Ethiopia and meet with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs there and the Ministry of Labor and Minister of um, uh, 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 social affairs uh, and the issue is that uh, they um, say that many of these ladies coming are coming from rural areas in a time where they are not doing much during the day and then they come here uh, and many uh, they have more than 20 or 30 requests per day which stresses their psychology and we have seen that a good number specifically among the Ethiopians are going into mental health and the uh, suicide rate is uh, the highest. And uh, if the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had done a uh, study, unfortunately, in Amharic that we couldn't read, uh, to uh, re-question why the suicide rate is high. And we went to shelters in Ethiopia where we saw that um, many of the migrants go back, they even forget their name, and uh, they can't relocate them with their families. So it can go uh, to, to that extent. Here we're not saying that all the migrants are abused. We need to uh, recognize that many employers do have good relationship with the migrants. We don't have an accurate number in terms of uh, percentage, but we know that this sector needs to be regulated and there are many issues to look at. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, I wanna highlight, and specifically now, jumping into the issue of the crisis with the corona and the post-revolution, which inflicted a socioeconomic challenge uh, is the issue of uh, increased uh, evictions. So Amel Association uh, with uh, Caritas uh, and in cooperation with IOM and the Ministry of Labor had supported in a part to uh, su support the first bunch of 37. So we did uh, an Amel with Fondation Mary PCR test to ensure that they can access the, the shelter. Uh, but uh, following it's been more than a week, we're really uh, upside down with these numbers on a daily basis of uh, whether the employer are leaving them in front of the embassy or because of the confinement. So there is lots of stress happening at home because mental health is an issue all over the world now. People, um, uh, psychology really going low with the, this long confinement. So there, 
uh, and increased exploitation and violence in some places. So where they're deciding to break the relationship and they're telling them, if you want to leave, you leave. So they're packing their luggage and going to the embassy. So we're seeing that and in the time where the airport is closed, so uh, they can't go. Many of them want shelter, shelters are um, already filled. So we are seeing these ways up until today, uh, yesterday, the a number of people that were identified, uh, we've been cooperating, uh, uh, AMIL, uh, CARITAS, MSF, uh, ARM, uh, IOM, uh, and others uh, to try to support as much in renting apartments, uh, providing some food, uh, sheltering, etc. But really, resources are very, very, very limited. Um, one thing that we have done after the um, uh, revolution, where we were conscious that uh, currencies devaluating, the uh, banks are blocking uh, all the Lebanese money and dollars, so they are not being able to pay the migrants. And some families are uh, putting almost all their uh, salary because they need to pay uh, four, three to four times uh, the uh, dollars in Lebanese lira, which is uh, taking a huge part of their salary to be able to pay the migrants. And we've, we've seen that. So to, again, to stress that there are good practices, but there are challenges on everyone. Uh, so what we did as NGOs, we requested from general security, especially for the irregular, to have an amnesty because every, these ladies that are not living with the employers, if they are late to pay their residency, every year that passes, they need to pay double and triple, et cetera. So they accepted to waive all these uh, years back and just to pay one year. It was accepted, but unfortunately the airport was closed. So now we signed again another letter requesting that even this one year uh, is waived. So, and we're still waiting for the feedback. So this will allow many of the irregulars to go back if uh, it, it works. But the other challenge is that some of them don't even have the ticket price. And uh, we're conscious about that. And this is really a problem, especially that the Ethiopian Airlines is asking that these tickets are paid in dollars in cash. And we know that the Lebanese don't have the dollars cash, which is not available. So who's paying the price is the migrants. But the other challenge is that also we request a, a bit much bigger cooperation from the countries of origin, because just yesterday, uh, at, uh, there was a flight because we've been, uh, as, as it was highlighted before in Karim's study, that not only uh, they are asking for the ticket, which was initially $680, but also they're asking the employers to pay 14 days of quarantine uh, because Ethiopia is not allowing anybody to get in uh, unless the 14 days are out. And they're asking the employer to pay it in the absence of US dollars. Uh, this is almost impossible. So again, the migrants, there were some flights organized and a very few went and this effort uh, did, did fail effectively. Uh, so again, there is a need for these countries of origin to cooperate more, to have quarantine spaces where they take charge of this uh, quarantine support. Uh, and I think we've been uh, highlighting and raising the voice to push, to mobilize more funds to maybe fund the tickets and uh, ensure their voluntary return. So, uh, and again, I want to highlight that among these ladies that are evicted, um, we really, the number of mental health cases has been uh, tremendous and it's increasing and it's a, a normal way it's already there, but now it's increasing with the, all the uh, general uh, corona setting. Um, I don't want to take much on it and I'm happy to answer more on the uh, Q&A, but I want to highlight recommendations. Um, uh, and what AMEL is doing actually. So in AMEL, uh, for almost a decade, we've been indulged in this effort and uh, we are responding to um, the uh, migrant domestic workers' rights in six categories. So mainly uh, uh, advocacy and lobbying, uh, being on the international level uh, for raising this voice up, uh, or at the same time, uh, on the local level where we uh, had an active role in reactivating the National Steering Committee that has most of the governmental organizations who are meeting on a regular basis. Uh, also, we succeeded to have an NGO coordination mechanism also that is meeting on a regular basis to address these issues with uh, trying to pressure the Ministry of Labor and Security with the other uh, counterparts uh, for more respect of migrant domestic workers, where we heard from them at some point that uh, civil society succeeded to put the migrant uh, labor rights before the Lebanese labor rights, which is, I think, promising to keep on going forward. The other level that our association is working on is the provision of services, being social, legal, health, and psychological, 
just now he is telling me about one of this uh, ladies that we supported to go back that uh, was uh, didn't have any option and it's great to hear how much this helps despite it takes we repatriated more than 330 cases back home awareness raising despite and the light of kafala system raising the awareness among employer and employee is really key and we succeeded to do that and enter the homes we have done this with ILO and other um, uh, organization among uh, migrant domestic workers, employers, and children. So uh, we can always do things uh, in the current situation to lessen the impact. Coordination with countries of origin. We already visited Sri Lanka, Nepal, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and we are in coordination with all the um, uh, organizations there uh, to support migrants, action-based research, and empowerment. So we have a center on rigor on a weekly basis we are meeting providing skills uh, to have a business here or when they go back home or to alleviate their uh, 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 psychology. Uh, main key recommendations is to that this, all of this migration cycle, and this is where we visited countries of origin to understand why migration is happening. So there are efforts need to be conducted from the day where these ladies come to train them, orient them, uh, ensure uh, recruitment pathways, decrease human trafficking and smuggling, and uh, whenever they come here, they have protection, that they are subject to the labor law, there is social security. And for Lebanon, now we're speaking about regularizing the um, domestic work and opening it uh, also to Lebanese. Uh, alternative to kafala is definitely on top to address the modern slavery. Um, it's a dream to have the migrants subject to minimum wage and not only to a wage that is based on their current uh, uh, scenario and their uh, back home. Um, break the person and from the, the uh, um, work relationship. So staying at home should be an option and not a must. Uh, and safer migration pathways in all its uh, levels. Uh, one, just a concluding remark that um, Noha highlighted is definitely this is an opportunity now, despite all the crisis, to try to regularize all the irregular migrants and have uh, maybe hoping for a return to Kafala. We know many of them want to go back, uh, but this international uh, discussion on racism uh, is also an opportunity to bring more equality, more humanity. The corona, despite all its impact, it's bringing back the dialect of respecting humanity versus profit and the capitalist model. I want to thank you a lot. We want to stress the value of humanity and dignity of every single person. And uh, just to highlight our AMIL slogan of positive thinking and uh, permanent optimism, and we're hoping for a better future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zeina. Um, we see that there is a very passionate <laughs> commitment in um, working in the human rights field from you and all our other panelists. So really, thank you very much for adding more inputs and elements on, on this very complex uh, um, situation and uh, um, problem with the uh, um, modern slavery. We used very... Um, very uh, complex words uh, referring to this uh, situation. So uh, we we pick up some questions from uh, uh, the audience. So one is uh, uh, from um, uh, uh, Aida Awell, and I guess it's for uh, Karim. And we'll give the opportunity also to the panelists in case to take just very um, few minutes to, to reply uh, to other um, interventions or questions. So Aida Awell was asking, uh, um, even though there is a, a lot of Ethiopian migrants going back to Ethiopia, a significant number will continue to work and stay in Lebanon, at least for a while. So it is impossible to repatriate uh, 400,000 Ethiopians in uh, one go. Uh, so the question from um, Aida is, uh, uh, with the lack of availability of US dollars, how will the working migrants remit with money? So um, the currency and the lira and the US dollar currency problem is a real problem in the whole situation for um, the economic crisis and it affects also uh, lives uh, uh, and uh, projections from uh, migrants as also the, the whole elements from uh, uh, 
buying the uh, the ticket and the cost uh, is obviously um, was um, also mentioned. So uh, Marco Amar is a question from Zeina Muhanna or Zeina Nuzere. Let's see. I understand there is an important discrepancy between what migrants get to know in their countries and what they actually get once they arrive in Lebanon. Uh, isn't there a network channel of communication between those? Uh, sorry, there is between um, those who have already experienced hardship and those who choose to leave their country. So this is the transnational relationship between the two uh, countries and the, the way uh, migrants get ready for their migration um, project. Then uh, Sonia Grieco, she's a journalist. The question is, uh, according to the World Bank, remittances to African countries increased by uh, 11 0.6% in 2018. Do you think it is possible that countries, not only Africans, that rely on these remittances are reluctant to favor the repatriation of domestic workers in fear of losing this substantial contribution? <laughs> Very complex question. Um, and uh, there was another uh, question with more details uh, on the um, bilateral agreement uh, uh, between Ethiopia and uh, Lebanon. So. I guess uh, uh, Karim can start uh, picking up from the first question and then uh, um, I guess maybe um, Zaina from ILO can, if, if, she, if this is uh, uh, in your uh, competencies, can tell us a little bit more on the bilateral agreement uh, between Lebanon and Ethiopia and maybe uh, Zaina Muhanna can also uh, tell something about this uh, transnational uh, missing uh, communication uh, gap. And for the last, uh, um, for, for those who want to pick up this uh, uh, comment on the World Bank uh, data and the uh, reluctancy of uh, origin countries to repatriate domestic workers, whoever wants to pick it up, <laughs> the floor is yours. So maybe uh, Karim wants to start and also maybe um, highlight any, any other relevant element that you want to share with the audience. Karim, make sure to speak loudly, please. <laughs> okay, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Mrs. Arrow, for the question. Uh, I think I'm back in line. Uh, yes, uh, will all the Ethiopians, will all the migrants uh, leave? Uh, this is not what I meant, obviously, when I said Lebanon is going to be off the migration map. It's not going to be the, as attractive as before for migration communities. Uh, but still, a lot of migrants will... Yeah. A lot of migrants will uh, remain in the in the country uh, because many Lebanese families can still afford to pay them in in, in dollar currency. Uh, and now that the financial circuit is, is, is has reopened uh, with the, with through the the financial uh, agencies, it's still possible for now to to send remittances back to the country. Um, so so for those who stay. It doesn't take away the problems of the kafala. This is why I was talking about uh, the window of opportunity, and, and this was further developed by Zena Mizer and Zena Hanna, uh, that needs to transform, that needs to be eradicated into a more equitable agreement between the employer on one side and the worker uh, on the other. But for those who cannot afford, for all these middle class, lower middle class, even higher middle class families who are losing their income, struggling to uh, to get uh, to put food on their table, uh, sometimes just struggling to put food on the workers' table, uh, hence the panic and sending her to her embassy for someone to, to become someone else's problem like a hot potato, which is clearly unethical. And, and this is and th these are one of those barbaric effects of the kafala, right? It's, 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 this is what, what abuse comes like it looks like. When you allow for such a system to exist in the first place. Um, so will, will we see the end of migrant workers in Lebanon? No, but just for those who can afford it. So this will create more inequality in Lebanon, to create more inequality among workers communities, uh, but definitely Lebanon will not be as attractive as before when it comes to migration paths in the region. Okay, 
Thanks a lot, Karim, for this uh, contribution. Uh, there was another um, comment in the Q&A that is, uh, where is it? From you, sorry. Catherine from um, UNHCR, uh, why many migrant workers currently want to go back to their home country? I just wanted to flag the importance of flagging to UNHCR any case of a person who expresses fears about returning to their country of origin, either because of a possible refugee claim or a trafficking situation. So they remain available to assess uh, these cases and assist uh, as necessary. So that's good that the, the community is uh, obviously um, responding and make it itself uh, visible. Uh, so um, I think uh, Zeina uh, Mezer from ASO, she, she wants to reply and also, uh, let's say, to the different uh, um, suggestions that, that we highlighted. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Um, just uh, on the question of uh, whether uh, migrant workers uh, share what they experience um, back at home. Um, so th there are two elements to this. On one hand, we have the whole recruitment process and the role of governments at both ends, countries of origin and the destination country, to have proper uh, monitoring of the recruitment mechanisms in order to ensure that recruitment is happening with a, um, a fair and transparent and ethical channels. And uh, unfortunately, this is lacking. This is still very weak, and which will allow uh, many layers of recruitment, not just the official recruitment agencies, but also sub-agents to also make uh, false promises to the migrant workers and sometimes to employers and complicate the situation. Now, in terms of sharing the knowledge of the experiences from migrant workers themselves to others, what we know from research, because uh, as you may be aware, we work in countries of origin and in destination, and we try to look at migration as a cycle. It doesn't start somewhere and end somewhere else. It's always continuing. So what we know from uh, either returnees or migrant workers who aspire to migrate is that often migration is a dream. It's a way out to have a better life. So those people who make it and can contribute to uh, either uh, lifting the social standards of their families, uh, build a small house, come back more empowered, and uh, um, you know, as a woman with you have seen the world and contributed, you know, to raising your family, there is pride in that. Often they'd rather keep that image than to share the uh, very tough stories that they had to endure. So there's that element, it's very personal, it's, um, and it would be interesting to see it from uh, anthropological research, how this is happening, the, the, the clear divide between the life of migrant workers uh, in the countries of destination and how they link up back to their community and their stories before and after. So there's that element where many migrant workers do not actually share their stories just because they want to keep the dream and they want to keep that image. Uh, some of the stories, you know, are uh, linked to uh, in destination, are linked to gender-based violence, are linked to perhaps sexual harassment, rape, uh, uh, all of these abuse. It's also very sensitive to women to be able to open up about that and share it within their communities. So these stories often um, are left untold. And even when they are told, and when they are exposed and when there are NGOs who are trying to raise awareness of um, uh, women mainly who uh, aspire to migrate, the power of the dream and, to, to, and what migration means and how they can perhaps change their lives gives that you know, uh, echo that maybe I will be luckier and I wouldn't fall into that. So this is why this whole information is not making its way to stop migration, and the intention is not to stop migration, might be part of uh, our, our lives, like for everyone. But the, the question is, how can we make it a safe migration? And this is here the role also of the government, and this is the challenge around bilateral agreements. So, while bilateral agreements are very important in order to define the relationship between uh, the two countries who are dealing with human life. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the desire for countries to uh, link to remittances 
and to perhaps sometimes procrastinate from dealing with problems that exist in countries of origin rather than think of uh, economic alternatives that may um, deviate the decision from migrating to another country to migrating to another city within the same country and so on. So there are a lot of responsibilities on governments to create job opportunities for, um, for, for, for their nationals, sometimes disable. So migration is a solution for governments. And because migration is a solution, they sometimes undermine some of the essential labor rights for the workers. So these rights do not make their way into the bilateral agreement. But as ILO, what we try to do is to promote uh, a, a common base for bilateral agreements. Again, as I mentioned earlier, to abolish the concept of discrimination based on nationality and to insert all the fundamental uh, rights at work to all workers into all these agreements. So the agreement becomes more a way to manage the migration, but the, but the basic rights should be respected and should be there in all agreements and not just the one negotiated, for example, by the Ethiopian with Lebanon uh, and the different ones, uh, Philippine with Lebanon or Philippine with Saudi, etc. The whole uh, labor mi mi migration should uh, encompass all these labor rights and uh, work on the different modalities to ensure their protection. I hope that's the question. Thanks a lot. I know it's very difficult uh, and I don't want to be rude <laughs> to, to stop you because the, the discussion could really go uh, and last for very long. Um, I would just uh, invite Zaina Mohana maybe to pick up a few elements of this uh, communication, uh, missing communication channel between uh, origin and destination country. Uh, so just very few minutes to, to comment on this. And maybe I just invite Noha, if she wants to take another minute uh, to, uh, to comment at the end, and then we will close up the, um, the meeting today. So uh, please, Zaina. Yes, thank you. I want to thank uh, Marco and dear Sonia that uh, Sonia was also working and Amel and Catherine for suggesting what UNHCR is offering uh, that definitely will cooperate. So mainly uh, we know that there is um, the whole uh, recruitment pathway is not well regulated and sadly this um, migration route that uh, most of the times is related to uh, enhancing a standard of living or addressing a problem uh, or uh, countering the uh, GBV. We know some of them, instead of divorcing, they leave, and many of them leave their uh, children that are really young at a small age and go to migration. They fall into smuggling, human trafficking, where this uh, business turns into, um, uh, which is a business for human lives and turns into a really bad stories. And uh, here, well, this is what we're calling ethical recruitment processes, uh, where bilateral agreement is the main um, uh, option, but this is nothing that the um, uh, that all the counterparts uh, put the human lives first in front of corruption and gaining profit. So this is really very essential. Uh, in terms of what Sonia answered, definitely is something that we're seeing. Whenever uh, Ethiopia is not uh, cooperating well to receive the migrants, or Sierra Leone is not welcoming their uh, diaspora uh, and encouraging them to stay where they are. Uh, this is also, there's a need uh, for cooperation from all the counterparts to address better uh, the uh, sustainability and the human rights of uh, uh, everyone. Um, and we have seen, like in the practice of Sri Lanka, that uh, there is more encouragement for uh, uh, men to go for migration and uh, less of women going there, so, which is one of the protection. Also, Sri Lanka had requested that a uh, mom that has a baby less than five years old is not allowed to go. And we know that many, many of them really, whenever they leave, their family uh, gets very affected. The husband goes into alcoholism, even cheating on her. Some children drop out of school, etc. So we cannot underestimate how much these ladies are suffering whenever they're uh, choosing to go abroad. And this is where we need to support their rights and their dignity. Just one highlight and an end note that Unfortunately, whenever a migrant with low economic background leaves, we call her a migrant worker. Uh, and whenever a high income person, we call him or her an expat. And this is also a name that uh, is addressed and has a discrimination angle where all of them are migrant workers at the end of the day. So um, we definitely need to think that post-corona, we have an opportunity 
of bringing back the role of the government, more maybe socialist regimes that address more rights than uh, profits uh, and more equality among all, uh, where job creation uh, should be among the top to address the world economic crisis. And I think everybody and hoping for better uh, migration, um, respect for migration rights all over the world and sustainability for everyone within humanity. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Zaina. Noha, do you want just to take the opportunity to add something? I think Noha disappeared, at least uh, from my screen. So, um, well, in case she appears again, <laughs> we'll give her um, the opportunity to say something. Um, so we, we also had the representative of uh, the syndicate uh, of recruitment agencies uh, uh, intervention that we, we plan to have, but Mr. Um, Ali um, actually had the, uh, an urgency th this morning, so he couldn't make it, uh, uh, but it would have been really a very um, interesting discussion also with the, uh, a private operator linking uh, um, uh, remit the, the um, countries of origin and destination in terms of the, the recruitment uh, of uh, domestic workers. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll also uh, discuss with him um, in the future. Uh, I really thank all panelists uh, for their availability, for being here, and all the um, participants to this meeting. Uh, again, um, I invite you all to follow up um, on the CHESPIS channels because in July we'll have uh, um, another uh, webinar based on the Ethiopian side to discuss uh, what is happening there for domestic workers, uh, what are the domestic workers that uh, uh, return or are repatriated doing or what is the aspiration uh, for uh, women there to to go to abroad, uh, either not, not anymore to Lebanon or to other countries. So um, we are also sharing, uh, and Zaina also is sharing her uh, contacts. Uh, um, all the documents will be available on the Chespis website. You will find them, find them soon. Um, I don't see Noha anymore, so I'm really afraid for this. I thank you very much for um, being here with us. Uh, and. Uh, um, and everybody, I think, is will be very happy to cooperate in the future, especially to address this uh, situation for Lebanon. So I, I see also the, um, the stakeholders are very active. So I, I guess we, we can only help uh, uh, increasing the uh, advocacy and lobby at the international level as CHESP and as a research partner. So thank you, everybody, for being here. And see you in July, uh, hopefully online. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks again.